So um, I will say welcome. Welcome to Accessibility in the Arts, a panel discussion for artists and agency applicants. In a moment, I am going to, and when I say applicants, I mean applicants to the California Creative Core. Um, and I have with me a few team members this morning, so I'm going to point them out. Katrina, hello. Good morning, if you want to wave at the camera. And Gianna and Michaelin. Gianna is helping us. She's going to be putting various links in the chat. For those of you who are able, if, if you want to open up your chat, you can follow along as Gianna um, puts instructions um, for different links as I refer to them. Having said that, I want to reassure you that we will be sharing the presentation that you see that introduces the topic and gives the context for the topic afterwards. So we're going to be writing to each of you by email and following up with you. So please don't worry if you if it's difficult to keep up with the pace at which Gianna um, copies uh, links and things like that into the chat. So um, Juliet, hello, welcome. Um, so I'm going to introduce just by name to begin with our ASL interpreters this morning, our American Sign Language interpreters, Jasmine and Kari. It is so great that you're with us. Thank you. Afterwards, for those of you who want to relive the presentation and relive the discussion, you will find it as a recorded session on our look and listen page of our Upstate Creative Core website. So no one will miss out and you can forward this on and share it with other people. Um, if suddenly we lose power in Nevada City because we literally are in the middle of a blizzard right now, uh, if suddenly we lose power, we'll do this again. We'll reschedule it, and um, and you know, and I I can only apologize in advance. <laughs> so I'm going to welcome by name our panelists today. We have six of them, and then I'm going to properly introduce them after I finish the introduction. So I'd like to wel welcome Lilian Navarro, Angie Velatuto. Indigo Moore, Amy Medeiros, Juliet Morris-Williams, and Abigail Stockinger. And Gianna, if you could um, please um, provide some written instructions in the chat for how, as participants, we can pin our panelists so that you can see them um, more easily because we intentionally chose a meeting format rather than a webinar format because we wanted to feel engaged with you um, and see who else was in the room. Um, and it helps, sometimes helps if you pin um, uh, those who are speaking in advance, you have them at hand. So first of all, I'm gonna share our presentation so we can just go straight into that. And um, I'm going to begin with a, um, I'm gonna share that now, let's, Share the screen, perfect. I'm gonna begin with a land acknowledgement. Together, we stand in solidarity with all of California's indigenous peoples. We acknowledge that our work takes place on the now occupied traditional lands of the Nisenan and Washoe peoples, who are the past, present, and future stewards of this place. We make this first step in our journey to develop relationships and cultural competencies to truly support native sovereignty. And with that, we welcome you more formally to Accessibility in the Arts, a panel discussion for artists and agency applicants. I'm going to start by sharing the program goals for Upstate California Creative Core. You're with us today because you're thinking of aligning yourself to one or other of these program goals, one or more, I should say, as an artist, a culture bearer, or an organization. If you're going to be a lead applicant, we're inviting you to apply for funding to implement media, outreach, and engagement campaigns that increase awareness for one or more of these goals. Public awareness for environment-related issues, such as water and energy conservation, 
climate mitigation, and emergency preparedness, relief and recovery, or civic engagement, such as elect election participation, social justice and community engagement, or public health awareness messages, such as mitigating the spread of COVID-19 or other communicable diseases, is accessibility a factor in application scoring? Yes, it is. Accessibility is one of the review criteria by which proposals will be evaluated. Applicants are asked to analyze their own design through an accessibility lens and aligning with California Arts Council, we're committed to making the arts accessible and inclusive for diverse populations in our upstate region. Funded initiatives, services, information and buildings and facilities where funded activities take place must be accessible and events must be free of charge. Upstate California Creative Corps staff are available to offer guidance and clarification in preparing your application, as are our partner agencies across the upstate region. You'll see that there's a link. And when you receive our PowerPoint, our slide deck after this, when we email it to you, you'll be able to link through to those partner agencies so you can see who's in your region. Here are, here are a couple of questions from our grant application. We've kept it very simple. Share the extent to which your project will be accessible, considering these key points. Describe the public component of your project and how it is accessible to the defined community. Describe your approach to ensure physical or digital accessibility through your initiative, and at what point in your pub process public access will be appropriate and catered for. So we leave it very open for you to tell us what this means for you as an artist or a primary applicant. And here's how we define access. And you can find this definition in the FAQ that we provide on our website, which is upstatecreativecore.org. The ability of an individual to fully participate in a given activity or an essential function in today's world, employment, transportation, self-advocacy, political engagement, mobility, etc. In order to bring about accessibility, sets of standards determine modifications of the physical environment, the inclusion of technical advances and specific supports for individuals who are challenged to fully participate in a non-modified setting. And here's some context. Um, according to the US Census Bureau, one fifth of our population is disabled. Investing in accessibility is a surefire way for any small scale arts organization or any organization to expand its viewership. It can include a wide variety of actions and policies from making a physical space wheelchair accessible and ensuring American Sign Language interpretation for public events to all gender restrooms and slide, sliding scale ticketing. The latter sliding scale ticketing probably doesn't really um, impact you because as we've mentioned, any, proje any projects or, or, or public facing events that become part of your funded projects by the California Creative Four Corps will be free. But as a principle, you know, organizations are encouraged to offer sliding scale ticketing. Prioritizing, prioritizing accessibility in arts spaces begins with asking oneself some basic questions. Who will come to our events? Why do those people come to our events? Who doesn't come to our events and why? Understanding the principles of universal design can be helpful through which the design and composition of an environment, initiative or process can be accessed, understood and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their age, size, ability or disability. Here's something from the National Endowment for the Arts when it's considering and this is just for context, it's, it gives you an example. The NEA requires applicants to consider physical and programmatic accessibility as an integral part of each project's planning and budgeting process. 
applicants may include the cost of access accommodations as part of their budgets, um, including sign language interpreters or audio describers. Applicants may also consider conducting programs in accessible venues other than their own organization in order to meet accessibility requirements. I'm, I'd like to just share these few links here um, later you will be able to access them. And I think Gianna, you were going to perhaps um, pop these in the chat as well now, but um, I don't want them to be a distraction for you knowing that you're going to have access to them afterwards. But these are just a few resources. Um, one of them is section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. One of them is a beautiful document, um, which although it, it's you know now about, I think it's 10 or 20 years old. And again, it's from the National Endowment for the Arts, the NEA, and it's called a Cultural Administrator's Handbook. And it provides a chronology of key dates connect, connected with the idea that access to the arts is a civic right. And then there's accessibility in the arts, a promise and a practice. This is the most gorgeous document. Um, and in itself, the document is just so accessible. There's an audio file connected to that link so you can listen to it as well. Um, it's in large format print and you'll be able to access it after this session. And then we've provided a very brief NEA accessibility checklist. It's literally two pages max. And it's just a helpful, it, it just triggers ideas for you as you're developing your projects. How can I make my, my project accessible to a larger number of people? No discussion on accessibility is complete without understanding the history of accessibility as a civic right. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 and the Rehabilitation Act of 73 are significant laws in the US's long history of enacting legislation to ensure the civil rights of its people. The concept of civil rights in this country began with the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Unfortunately, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, although promising in sentiment, did not provide specifics. Hence, the disability rights movement, though relatively new, vividly brings the needs, concerns, and rights of people with disabilities to national attention. If all this is seeming like a bit much to take in, and you're thinking, I had such a great project that I had already aligned to one or other or more program goal for the Upstate California Creative Corps, please don't be discouraged. Think back to the original definition in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary of Definitions of Access. Really, if you, if you read these beautiful, simple words, they make such sense. Um, permission, liberty, or ability to enter, approach, or pass to and from a place, or to approach or communicate with a person or thing freedom or ability to obtain or make use of something, a way or means of entering or approaching, and the act or an instance of accessing something. So I, I really love to keep this simple as well. We're sharing a lot of information today. Don't get put off. Here are some key links. And again, we'll be sharing these with you. So if you don't catch them from the chat, here they are. Um, Upstate Creative Core, how to find us on social media. We also do have a, um, a Facebook group called Conversation Cafe, which is very active, where you can jump in, introduce yourself, who you are, what your needs are, whether you want to partner with people, what your ideas are, and get conversations going with other potential applicants. There's our email address. And uh, Nevada County Arts Council, as you know, is the administering organization for these essentially state funds through Upstate California Creative Corps. We, in turn, are answerable to California Arts Council. So that's it. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, 
and um, I'm noticing lots and lots of of of, uh, of information that's been shared with you on the chat. But let's go straight into welcoming our panelists. Gianna, would you share biographies for our panelists? We have six panelists, and that's six really fabulous, juicy biographies. So I welcome you to um, read in your own time from the uh, fr from the from the chat, and we'll be sharing with you the uh, full biographies afterwards as well. But again, welcome to Liliane, Angie, Indigo, Amy, Juliet, and Abigail. What a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, I'd like to start with a question, Juliet. I might ask you this question. Um, how does it make you feel when you are included? Included as an artist, included as someone who lives with special abilities. Um, how does it make you feel when others have taken into account your needs in a public setting? Well, thank you, Eliza, and hello, everybody. Um, to me, it's very important to feel as though everyone is included, but I know that that's not always the case. And um, when a place has really made an effort to include, it it really it's like a breath breath of fresh air. It's it's as though you feel open to everything, that you can relax in a place, you can explore and not feel like you're taking too much time. Um, you can ask questions. It really makes you feel comfortable. And that that's essentially, that's, that's what it feels like. <laughs> I Fantastic. Think. Fantastic. And is there any context that you wish to give for those who might not have access to their chat? Would you like to just share a little bit of why this is important to you um, and the constraints that you're working with and the delicious challenge that you've shared with me is your, is your goal? Well, I, I feel very strongly that everyone needs a chance to express themselves. It doesn't matter if how good you are, how, how able you are, what matters is that you have a voice and it should be heard if you want it. And, and I, I want to feel that everyone has that chance. So for example, with the Osborne Woods Gallery, which is a tiny gallery attached to the Miners Foundry, I wanted to make it as accessible as possible. Uh, and the money for that was, it, it was slow in coming, but we have now uh, enabled it. To, we've flattened the floor. We had a huge step in the floor there where it was difficult. No one could, with a wheelchair could really see the entire space. And we made accommodations for that by, you know, for different means, but now it's a completely flat gallery. And things like that were available through a grant grants that I applied for so that we could make the space open to everyone. And that's just that's just one thing that was such a, a joy and a thrill to be able to offer to the community. Oh. <laughs> Thank that, you. Is that okay? okay? Oh, everything you say is okay, Juliet. Thank you so much. <laughs> Amy, I wondered if you would like to answer that. You run, for many years, you've been running um, Neighborhood Center of the Arts. Would you like to sort of follow on from that in terms of your experience as an administrator? And of course, you're also an artist um, in terms of what you've seen in terms of the, the way that access creates an open door for your students and the people that work you work with with special abilities. Right. Well, to follow uh, what Juliet said, it's important not to focus on one's disability. Um, we call them abilities. So the artists that come into our program, our working studios, we definitely focus on their arts ability. Um, I've worked really hard over the, over the last 17 years to make sure the community doesn't see us 
as, oh, that's an someone with Down syndrome who created that. It's really important to us as well as my artists, like that's another artist of the community. Um, we are working artists up at Neighborhood Center, regardless of what barriers we might have. Um, being included in the community is really important when other galleries or other working artists within our community um, recognize us for artists first. Um, we have a saying, we put our disabilities last and our art abilities first. Um, that's super important to us. And there is no right and wrong to being an artist. Um, we like to celebrate the fact that if you're blind, you can sit at the loom and learn to weave. Um, you know, we like to provide everybody with the tools without holding any limitations back and letting them explore um, what they're capable of doing. It's exciting to see what they're capable of doing. Um, we don't like to hold anyone, you know, below any high expectation. We just like to provide what we can. Thank you, Amy. Liliane, um, I would love to ask you that same question. How does it make you feel when you are included in um, the work of another? when it's offered in a public setting. How does that make you feel? Well, it's always made me feel like I'm being seen and not my disability. The disability is there, but it's just not part of all of it. It's not all of my identity. So it, it makes my disability take up that corner and so I can just be the part of the community like everyone else. Liliane, thank you. I, I read the most incredibly beautiful poem by you this morning. I know that you're both a visual artist and you're a poet, you're a poetess and um, it was beautiful and, and, and I'm reading in your biography that you won um, the Hobson Prize for the best entry in any genre that built bridges between species, religions, cultures, ages and genders. And um, I'm trying to remember, um, oh, it was called The Real Me, absolutely beautiful. Do I have your permission to share that poem? afterwards with when we do our follow-up email I would like everyone to have access to that beautiful poem which summarizes this so beautifully. Sure. And of course Indigo um, you are a poet as well. Um, I I'd be interested in asking you you know thinking about the fact that we're here today with applicants to the creative core. Um, can you share some examples of ways in which you've removed barriers to participation through your work? So often we think of, of barriers being um, very, very specific, but tell us about how your work is accessible, becomes accessible, what it means to you. Well, I've uh, transitioned. Over the years, I mean, I was first considered a jazz poet, which was interesting because I was just a guy who liked jazz and often wrote about it. And when I moved to a more, shall we say, political realm, I wanted to be careful because oftentimes the people that you are trying to reach are people that you are also not necessarily blaming for something, but saying this is a part of who you are. And I believe it's important to not alienate them. I was on a panel once, well, not a panel, but a reading with a, uh, another writer who believed that he would say what he wanted to say, and if they didn't like it, tell. And I understand we need these types of warriors, but I don't believe that people listen to them. Um, I believe that my work 
is often not bombastic, but uh, it can be very in your face when never blaming someone. I believe that encouraging someone to see who they are, even if it's me, I believe it's important to have that inclusive nature in your work. I was on NPR doing the uh, resistance and the riots, and it was difficult for me because I was also on with the police chief to speak without being a person who would alienate this person. And I believe I succeeded. I, I, I believe that the the ability to see yourself in someone else's shoes raises your ability to, to enable the accessibility in your work. That's and I have right. no idea if I just answered what you've asked or not. <laughs> There's no right or wrong answer. The reason that you and Amy and Juliet and Angie um, and Abigail are with us today and Lilian is because we want to hear from you both as artists and um, as individuals which have very personal relationships to what access means. Um, so I, I love it. I'd like to hear from Abigail um, your sense of what access means for you, both as an artist creating work for yourself and for the public and someone who lives with, um, uh, you know, special abilities, disabilities. Tell us how you place yourself in this. Um, I will try not to go off. You all said so many things beautifully and I definitely align with it. Um, Abigail, my own experience I, is, um, yeah. Oh. May I suggest that you, I, I hate not being able to see your face, but your um, internet's a bit patchy. Maybe just try turning off your video because what, what you're saying is so valuable. Okay, I will do so. How is that? Perfect. Okay. Um, I, oh gosh, there's so many experiences. Accessibility, you know, the main thing I've been living with my disability for 20, almost 23 years now. And um, I, there have been amazing things, but, you know, there are barriers and I hate saying, like, um, I don't like, oh, it, it, I fight this, I fight that. There is room definitely for anger and creating new ground. And art is a perfect way of doing that. But I prefer, and I'm trying to change the language, not only for myself, but with others, is living with this. This is a part of me the disability, the abilities, this is a part of me. And at learning to create that space for not only for my, my myself as an individual, but also how do I get this for others, using art as a tool and as a way of communication on how we, ha we live with this. This is and how do we have a better life? How do we thrive with it? And using art is the, one of the main ways I do it. And with it, you know, um, I have experienced, you know, there, when I run into things on a day-to-day -day basis that are difficult because of people's perceptions and with disability and the fact that, you know, um, like it's not accessible, I can't get into that building. When it comes to the things that help me thrive, like art, um, it makes it harder. And so when these places that exist or if these moments I can help create, whether it's with a piece of art or collaborating with someone that is um, doing something musical, anything that allows that barrier to not exist, makes it easier to deal with the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, 
And that is what I do myself. And um, my biggest thing right now is taking past experiences and how can I do my own self-expression, but with that, helping others, abilities, disabilities, just claim their identities and do it in um, a very expressive, communicative manner. Um, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. It makes, <laughs> it makes so much sense. And just for everybody else's benefit, um, I first met Abigail when we were conducting a listening tour of the 19 county upstate region in California that is our service area for the California Creative Corps. And I, I kind of instantly uh, fell in love and could see the incredible value. Um, and anyone who was with us um, in Red Bluff that afternoon um, in the uh, late autumn will probably remember it was a, you spoke so beautifully about, you challenged everyone in the room, include me in your thinking with projects. The lens I bring is so important and everybody got it. And I remember we left with a strong sense of, <laughs> you know, of, of this was going to lead to something. So I'm hoping that when we speak outside of this meeting, you're going to tell me that you're involved in one or other project and that you're being um, involved as either a consultant or an artist um, in their own right within a project that comes from Tehama. Uh, we loved meeting you, Abigail. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. And that day was profound. And I, I, sorry, I wanted to interject, like one of my main goals that I was hoping to just share um, and with you is that I feel really invested. You know, I've lived half my life in the Bay Area and half my life in, um, in Plumas County. And I now reside in Red Bluff. And I feel like a part of me is Northern California. Like this is in my blood. And I think we have an opportunity here to create something that will last for our future generations. And I think we have this opportunity to do something different and better and create the bones of something. You know, we can, like you were saying earlier, the words, are simple, but if we can start and collaborate and set something up, I think that this is a great start. Instead of tearing something down, I think we can build something up together. So Fabulous. I'm so glad you feel like that. And I hope everyone else feels like that. And I think part of the reason we're meeting today with access as a lens is that it will ensure that more of us are involved in creating that foundational piece for uh, a future that in includes more, more of us, more people. Um, I'd like to ask um, Angie, we haven't pr probably, probably said hello to you, and I believe that you're joining us from Eureka. Um, great thanks to Leslie from the Inc. people for introducing us to both Lillian and Angie. Angie, you've worked with Lillian. Lillian, you've worked with Angie. I'd love to ask you, Angie, um, for the benefit of applicants to the Creative Core um, listening in today, can you share some examples of ways in which you've helped remove barriers to participation through the work you do and perhaps provide some context for that? Sure, thanks for the introduction. Um, I think that there's a lot of different ways in which access can be provided. And I appreciate that this grant um, includes that if there is some type of a performance or a presentation that, that is free, um, because economic barrier is one of the biggest barriers that I've encountered. And part of the work that I do through Dreammaker Project of the Ink People is to assist artists in whatever means that they need to further their career. And, and sometimes that is this economic barrier, um, helping an artist um, apply for grant funding, looking for sources of, 
um, support for their projects. Um, that can be a, a pretty big factor. Um, I think that a lot of what I'm beginning to see my involvement in um, would be access through support. Um, so I think that traditionally you'll think of access as, you know, can a person enter a building? Can a person um, hear the presentation? Um, can a person see the slides? Um, but there is this other layer of, well, can this person enjoy this experience the same way that somebody else does who doesn't have those same barriers? Um, and, and this is something that is sort of, um, was contextualized for me in um, a speech from Alice Shepard um, in that, you know, we may all be able to enter the building, but, you know, can everyone enter it with the same quality of experience? Um, so I, I guess that, I mean, that's sort of, I want for myself and for others to sort of expand their thinking on what is access. Um, you know, if I can provide support to somebody so that they can um, write a grant, um, get funding for their project, um, either understand what the question in the grant requires, like that's access. Um, yeah, so I guess that's a little bit of where I'm coming from. It's almost as if some healthy creative visualization at the outset of project design is required, where mm -hmm. one can walk oneself in one's own mind as an artist through a project um, or through a lead applicant, whether it's an artist or an app uh, or a, an organization. And going back to those questions, you know, who is going to come to this thing which I am creating, and what is their experience going to be? and literally um, walk oneself through it step by step and challenge oneself to make that welcoming environment, that quality that you're referring to, Angie. Are we on the right track there? Yes, exactly. Yeah, creative visualization is a fabulous tool at any given time. Um, Indigo, it looks like you were nodding and agreeing with that. Do you Absolutely. sometimes? Yes. Yeah, and... Uh the quote that she gave i thought well, i was trying to write it down and i didn't catch it i'm hoping that you would put it in the chat i i think that's wonderful i think that's the essence of what we're looking at can we all walk into and i know i'm paraphrasing the house in the same manner i was uh at the poor lawyer inauguration and the man in the audience asked me what I had written for him. And he was, a, he was a white male. And he was basically asking me, have I written anything from a white point of view? How would he enter my work? And I am very fortunate to have had someone else been asked that question before. So I was prepared, I believe, to answer it. And what I asked him, was, does he feel the African-American experience that I mostly wrote from was part of his life? And it's this type of accessibility that I believe is, it can be very damning or it can be very open. Um, when I'm writing, do I feel that uh, I'm writing for a woman's perspective? Because I've written from women's perspectives before. I haven't always written well from a woman's <laughs> perspective, but I try to make it as real as possible. And I believe the ability to do this invites others to be a part of what we're doing. I want people of all walks of life to come to what I'm doing. Uh, the fire water exhibit uh, that was in Truckee, I wrote a poem that uh, from the viewpoint of the fire itself, and I recognize that fire isn't coming to any of my readings, but just the idea of 
having people look at it from that perspective and knowing that what we're seeing is the same thing is important. So uh, Angie, I do hope you put that quote in there. I really want to piggyback off of it. I thought it was wonderful. Thank you. I love Angie, sorry, did you have a, a follow up that you wanted to? Um, I was just going to say thanks to Indigo and um, I will try and dig that up. It's something that Alice Shepard shared in a recent training about accessibility that I, I just found to open my my whole thinking in a deeper level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are so many different ways of thinking about accessibility and um, one of the 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 uh, and, and that that actually led us to to share in the PowerPoint, which you'll receive the slide deck uh, later with the links. We shared very different sorts of resources for you because each one, you know, one is very formal, one is very human and filled with empathy. Um, uh, there is one, the one that I, I pointed out by uh, Carolyn Lazard is, oops, uh, electricity is going on and off here, by the way, you might see. <laughs> So be prepared. Um, yes, it's still snowing incredibly hard outside. It's very beautiful. I don't think any of us will ever forget this day up in the Sierra Nevada. Um, I, I will share a, a story with you. The idea of the degree to which one individual will feel more or less welcome in the very same space that is being experienced by others. Um, earlier in the fall, in 2022, we had a beautiful event that was designed for our creative sector called the Business of Art. And we chose an ADA accessible building for it. And we intentionally chose it. And we uh, determined the entrance that would be best suited for those um, with mobility issues. What we didn't take into account is that once inside the building, there were steps. And so the, uh, there was at least one individual on the day who felt grateful to be able to enter the building and that we cho chose an accessible site and they had driven from some distance um, to get to us only to find that we hadn't properly researched which doors needed to be unlocked in order to get them to other places to access other we can all be improving the way in which people feel welcome. <laughs> um, it's now 12.49. I'm, I'd like to welcome any questions, um, perhaps in the chat. Gianna, are we getting any questions? Yes, that's it. Just speaking out for um, Eliza, I'm also in Nevada City and the power is blinking on and off. So uh, she might not know, but I just wanted to let everyone know that's probably what happened. <laughs> Hi everyone. So I'm here in the same office as Eliza and because our power is going on and off, um, somehow her computer just shut down, but we're still on and we're still live. So. This is good. And she, yeah. So um, why don't everybody share questions in the chat? This would be a good time. And you can, sh you know, you can share your questions with any of the panelists that we have here with us today. And, you know, I, I know Eliza will be joining us shortly. So feel free to ask your questions in the chat, please. Okay. Hello again, everybody. I've switched to my laptop.
All right, so I just asked a very naive question, but only because I don't know the answer. Or how do, I mean, how does, yes. Eliza, you're muted. Thanks so much. Thank you. Would any one of the panelists like to answer Indigo's question um, about how, how to make one's visual arts projects more accessible? Is that really your question, Indigo? It, it really is because I, I, I deal with a lot of visual artists, but their work is I won't say static because it's certainly not true, but they produce the work that they produce and they set up these beautiful events. And I don't think I've ever heard them speak of accessibility before. So I'm just interested in how it works. I, um, I'll interject. I've been working with um, this really lovely uh, a collaborative group called Opulent Mobility out of Southern California. Oh. And they have been fantastic. And I honestly have been just thoroughly inspired. Laura Brody is the kind of uh, co-creator of the group, but one of the things that she specifically did, then I participated in a gallery show in 2020, um, is they specifically set up the experience to be um, for people with visual impairments, they have a full description of the artwork, whether it's visual, um, they break it down with words in the most beautiful descriptive manner. And then for um, just all inclusive, those are the things I know I'm missing on some of the things, but um, just that is part of the discussion. And um, one of the things I experienced at a show is for people that make it tangible and you have space for whether you have mobility issues, you can actually approach the artwork mm -hmm. in a specific manner. So it's, a, it's that, it's time. So those are very specific things that help the audience participate with the artwork itself. Uh, and so you get all the senses involved so that there is the inclusion of vocal, tangible, visual, whatever way you can make it translate mm -hmm. and creating the space literally so that people can get in or around it, you know, um, mm -hmm. and that and opulent mobility was one of the things and I strive to try and get that inclusion um and i i know i'm missing some of it because i i get my head gets going faster than my mouth and i apologize but that's no, very much right. <laughs> that's very much like what i have experienced as the participant as an artist and it was amazing to see like okay i'm going to describe this and what words do i use that are better and yeah um that's one of the ways that was totally accessible besides the fact that like it was online during COVID. So mm. it was able to be part of, if you have the technology, you know, and we had to be careful about space. It was respectful of that too. It was really, really fantastic. So that's oh, part of it for me. Thank you very much. So perhaps, perhaps the idea of if we think of the many different ways we experience through our different senses, how can that then be translated into the physical space? Mm. I'm wondering, um, Liliane, if you have anything you would like to contribute to that as both an artist and uh, you're a visual artist as well as a poet and, and what you have found to be very practical um, when you experience another's art and how that how they've thoughtfully um, included that consideration in their project. When I was a child, 
There was an exhibit that asked the children to include um, their own art to a lot more like, you know, include themselves in the art that was on display, um, whether we were collaging or painting or whatever. And I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't really get up to the art in a way to reach it, but they had docents there who brought pieces to me without mm -hmm. asking me, you know. They just, they saw me and they, oh, just a minute, and they were like, they had a bucket of different things, they asked me what I would enjoy, and when I put together a part, then they asked me where I wanted to put, put it in the art piece, so it was very um, participatory for me, and I didn't feel left out at all. I actually felt like um, my part was also as important as any other of the children. Very nice. Very nice, Lillian. So it was almost as if you were given the opportunity to participate without feeling that it was, without, without feeling that you were being made an exception of. Yeah. That it was yeah. just something that happened naturally, that had been thought of in advance. Yeah. So mm -hmm. in, just like everyone else. Yeah. I love it. Does that resonate for you, Juliet, too? Yes, very much. I really appreciate what you said, Lilian, because it was important for me, it has been in the past several years, um, to make the Osborne Woods Gallery as accessible as possible. And because there was a huge step in the middle of the gallery, we had problems with that for a long time. But we, when we had someone come in who had disability or mobility issues, I should say, we would do exactly that. We'd say, would you like to see something from up there? Let's, I'll show you what we've got. And we'd bring the art down nice. to where they could see it. Um, then what I also, I received a grant to do some work for Freed um, we did an art exhibit there where we learned how to create an accessible gallery. And part of that entails giving accessibility to everyone. So the, all the art on the walls or any sculpture is hung down at a certain angle. I think it's an, a, a foot and a half from the ground, <clears throat> maybe two feet. That means that anyone who is in a wheelchair or a walker or has any other issues can see the art face to face and not have to look up at it. That gives you a full experience of the piece. Then the other thing is to include braille at each station. So anyone who needs extra information and can't quite read uh, or knows needs the braille, it's there. Um, those are some of the things that were really important. And I, just to add an example of something that really uh, gave me a lot of concern and but then in, inspiration was I got a grant where I last year I went to the home of Frida Kahlo in Mexico City and she has really been an inspiration for me so I thought boy what an exciting thing to go to her house and see how this woman lived well I was in a wheelchair and so going into her house was great I, you know, they, they very accessible, but then I wanted to see very importantly to me was her bedroom where she created her art for most of her life. It's upstairs and there's no accessibility upstairs to see her bedroom, which is what I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. So because I'm able to get up out of the wheelchair and use a cane, I could climb the stairs, but I'm working with them now to, to figure out a way they can do it to get a lift up to the bedroom. So mm -hmm. it's important. Anyway, that's, <laughs> I just wanted to share that because what you said, Lilian, really resonated with me. So thank you. Mm -hmm. 
That's incredible. So you you sort mm -hmm. of inadvertently became a bit of an activist in Mexico. <laughs> That's fabulous. That's great, Juliet. Um, I'm just reading a, aloud a um, Eve. Um, you had a question. My project will utilize an existing level earthen trail in a public park. Should I include in the budget costs for bringing the trail up to ADA standards? Mm. In a way, um, so my question back to you would be, are you thinking of applying for category one as a solo artist or an artist, a solo artist working with a small number of other artists? Or if not, and you're thinking of applying through an agency for a community residency, I, a couple of things that I might answer is, um, perhaps bring along a friend who you who who lives with a, a disability or a special ability, and as as a tester to to see what their experience would be like on that earthen trail. But then also make sure that you bring along your um, the agency that would be the lead applicant and see the degree to which they feel responsible for helping with that. Because remember that your partner agency is a partner. You're not on this in this alone. Mm -hmm. And that's a question for them as well. I hope that's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Yeah, I am going to be applying for a community residency. And um, it, um, yeah, my intent was to have an art piece that was interactive and indicated problems with the trails so that the organization could in the future act on them. Fantastic, that's great. And even, even making sure that that note is in your application is very powerful because it shows that you're moving the needle. Um, Amy, I'm curious as to whether you're able to follow the chat and whether you have any you want to give any particular input on any of the questions that I'm seeing coming up? Gianna, if likewise, if there's anything you want to point to in terms of an unanswered question here, and whether... Yeah, Luan has a question. Yes. Oh, yes. We are, Luan says, we are developing a creative reuse center and hiring resident artists. Any initial thoughts on how we can make our project more accessible in terms of hiring artists and other parts of the project? Um, Amy, I don't, you, sorry, go ahead. No, no, who, who sorry, I, I didn't, Abigail and Amy, please. Amy, you go first, uh, I'll, I'll articulate later. Well, um, Eliza was busy thinking and of for Eve, I don't know where you live, Eve. Um, what part of California you are from? Butte County. Um, Butte County. Okay, I know up here in Nevada County, we have a local land trust that you know already has ADA trails. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have anything similar that you could partner with. Um, I know, for example, up here we have the Lytton Trail that's um, ADA accessible, so a lot of our artists access that. Um, so you might want to, you know, do a little bit more homework and see if there's something out there and, and change your location idea. Just a thought. Um, thank you. I will totally add to that. That's awesome. Um, Amy, thank you. Totally sparked a memory for me. And Eve, this is, I live next to you in Tehama. So I think maybe we should talk too afterwards, but specifically, this is a passion project for me because I remember during my college experience I went to the Marin Headlands to see the residency because they have that amazing they have such amazing artists come out of there and I was like I want to see I want to participate and it's not accessible at all and I was flattened and that has been one of my big things like I think because I look at residencies I have for the last 15 years and there's none that, that are fully accessible mm -hmm. um, on a, any of the disability fronts at all. Like, and um, segue into that on the side, I've worked with Solana Land Trust and they have this amazing center 
at Rush Ranch where it is inclusive mm -hmm. um, interaction with the trails. Like Amy was saying, like it, it is this amazing place that has these parts that are accessible and tangible that interact with the historical parts of the property mm -hmm. and allow space for artists, hopefully. And some of the artwork around there is part of the whole experience. And it's a combination of, and that's more of a science space, but I think the earthen works and residence, art residency and making it accessible would be amazing. And that's exactly, a, yeah, this is something I'm totally passionate about and I think we could do, do it. Yeah, I hope that made sense. I think, and may I ask who is just speaking? You were not showing up on my screen. Oh, it's uh, my internet is in and out because of the storm. I'm Abigail. Abigail. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I want to acknowledge again the idea of docents. Um, Leslie, I can see that you you too feel similarly. Um, you've you've written in the in the chat. I love the idea of docents su to support a wide variety of engagement opportunities. The idea of writing docents into the grants for Upstate Creative Core, it's a beautiful idea, isn't it? Crosses so many bridges and potentially removes so many barriers and can be done in such an empathetic way. I love it too. And I think that kind of came from Lillianne, um, yeah. from her example. So Lillianne, thank you so much. We're sort of at time, partly because I'd really love to acknowledge our incredible interpreters today. Kari and Jasmine, you've been just super. It's been great to have you with us. Um, I want to keep in touch. And I actually encouraged, um, can you remind me of the name of the amazing agency? It's a California-based. Eaton Interpreting, mm? e Eaton Interpreting Services. Thank you so much to Eaton Interpreting Services in California. You've been fantastic. And we're very happy to share a link to um, the to, the to this agency if you yourselves need um interpret interpreters as part of your project process so reach out to us just to say um thank you thank you thank you to lillian to angie to indigo to amy to juliet and to abigail um you've been amazing i wish we had all day um mm -hmm. but we don't but we'll continue this conversation this has been recorded it will be um put up on our look and listen page. We'll write to you all because you registered. We have your email addresses and we'll make sure that you have um, the slide deck that we shared and the recording. So I want to thank you all so much for your participation today. Let's go create some really great accessible projects. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks guys.